<clears throat> I think about when you're going through tough times, God has already finished the story. The script has already been written. It cannot be changed. It cannot be altered. It doesn't matter what's happening right now. The end of the story is the church leaves triumphant. <clears throat> the devil is cast into hell. All liberals lose. There won't be any sin in the earth. God will make right what's wrong. Didn't matter how it looked when Jesus was hanging on the cross. He's bleeding. He's wounded. His people are scattered. His mama's weeping. But the word said, hold on. In three days, it's going to be all right. And that's what God's trying to get us to do is look past the moment. You got to look past the moment. That's what faith is. When you get in those tough places, you just sit down in the chair called faith and you rest. Whenever you get pushed out of your own limits, you just sit down in the chair called faith. And you say, okay, God, it's on you now. And the Lord says, okay, I'll take it. Hallelujah. All right. But you might want to fasten your seatbelts because we're going to go up. Hallelujah. Um, why don't you turn with me to the book of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15, and we're going to read some of the story of the prodigal son. This has been in my spirit, and I think it's very applicable to where we are now, that God is doing great things. What a tremendous moment of worship that we had. We, we tasted of something. And what you're going to find, and I, I, I begin to look for it, I, I begin to look for angels to show up. I start looking across the platform and up there, but what we're going to find is we're going to enter into those moments and we're not going to come out of them. God's just going to keep us right there, and then Lord knows what's going to happen in the building when that, when that begins to happen. But God is warming us up for the things of the Lord, and there is a dome of protection right now over God's people and over this church, and the enemy can't penetrate it. And so everything uh, is blessed by the Lord. <clears throat> Out of the Gospel of Luke, the story of the prodigal son, uh, verse 11, and he said, Jesus, this is Jesus, he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided, this is very interesting, he divided unto them his living. Not many days afterward, the young son or the younger son gathered all together took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. Verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hard servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. This, uh, in this story, there are four different people that are mentioned. There is the father, and then there are two sons, two boys, and then there's an unnamed man, it just says a citizen of another country. But unnamed and woven very subtly into this narrative, there is another individual, and that is the devil. Bad things happen because the devil shows up. And the devil, he's not named in here, and of course, this is how the devil always moves. He loves 
anonym anonymity. And uh, one of the reasons that he has become successful in this hour is that he has convinced a large contingency of the population in the earth that he does not exist. And so if he does not exist, you can't blame it on evil. You can't blame it on the devil. And there is no hell. And it's interesting how lots of people don't believe in hell, but they believe in heaven. And so in this story, um, the scripture says that the younger son came to his father one day and he said, I want my inheritance. When we read this story, the um, Bible says that the father divided he didn't just give the younger son his inheritance. The scripture says he gave both sons their inheritance. He gave them his inheritance. And after a while, it said in not many days hence, the younger son became restless. When you read this, lots of people uh, think of the younger son, they said, well, he was greedy, he wanted the money, you know, he wanted all of that. That wasn't the issue with him because he already had money. This is not a rags to riches story. He was born into wealth. He had the best. He went to the best schools. If you put him in our time, uh, he got the sports car when he was 16, and he went to the best schools, and, and he was used to people taking care of him, and he got to live in a wonderful home, and he ate the best food, and people waited on him. So it wasn't that he was looking for wealth. That wasn't it. It's just that the blessing wasn't enough. He wanted control of it. And I've seen it so many times over the years that the presence of God is not enough for people. And they want to control it. They get a restless spirit. I can name you a lot of people that are not successful in life today because the duration of how long they last in a local church is two to three years and then to the next church in the city. And over a 15-year period, they went to nine churches in the same city because they are not looking for the presence of the Lord. They're looking for control. Whenever you go to church... And you're looking for that. You're not looking for the presence of God. You're looking for a church that would just help further your own ministry. You're not going to last. God has to be enough. And it didn't matter that he was wealthy. It didn't matter that he had no needs. It didn't matter that servants called him sir. It wasn't the blessing that he was after. He wanted to control the blessing. And that's where a lot of people are today. They, Lord, I want to serve you, but I want to be in control. I want to write the narrative of how I live for you. I, I don't want to go to church every Sunday. I don't want to fast. I don't want to have a prayer life. But I'm want the blessings of the house whenever you get there the spirit of restlessness will get a hold of you and it will drive you from the presence of the Lord to where God is not enough anymore and you just want 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 and so the scripture says that the father brought his boys in and he gave them both their inheritance Yet the older son never left. It's very funny how you ever seen some people, they're great Christians until God blesses them. And then they can't come to church because they're too busy enjoying the blessings. They're too busy 
on weekends at the beach house God gave them or the boat that God gave them. And yet there are other people, the elder brother, he has some maturity. We understand that the blessing that God gives you in your life is not to separate you from him, but is to give you a more time in the presence of the Lord. You don't have to work so hard. You're not working six days a week in overtime and coming to church exhausted. But God finally lets you have your own business. and You get to come midweek and you get to come on Sundays and you get to go to conference and you got enough time to get up in the mornings and read your Bible and get on your knees and begin to tell the Lord I love you Jesus. I want to thank you that you blessed me with my house. I want to thank you that you blessed me with my job. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And the younger son Fellowship with the father wasn't enough to hold him in the house. Part of it was he was just spoiled. He didn't know what it was like out there because the father had shielded him from the ugly side of life. How many been out there and seen the ugly side? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It makes you want to be where the Lord is. And so the scripture tells us that one day, the elder, the the younger son, he took his inheritance and he walked out of the house and he left the father. I want to go to uh, Revelations, I think it's the second chapter. And I want to talk about, because in this story, it's not mentioned by name, but there is a spirit that's at work in this story, and and Jesus calls it the doctrine of Balaam. And I forget which church he was speaking to, but he said, you have the doctrine of Balaam, and he said, I hate that doctrine. And if you're not familiar with the doctor of Balaam, you got to go back to the Old Testament because Balak, who was an ungodly king, hated the children of Israel, God's people. And he, was, he had already seen how they had won victories, and he was afraid that they were going to defeat him And so he hired a sorcerer named Balaam. And he said, I want you to curse God's people. The doctrine of Balaam is this. You can't curse what God has already blessed. And this sorcerer found out that what had worked on other groups wasn't going to work on God's people. He couldn't come up with an incantation. He couldn't come up with a spell. He couldn't come up with sorcery. He couldn't come up with all kinds of stuff in a concoction of an iron pot. He didn't have anything that could curse God's people. Because you can't curse people that are in the presence and the will of God. And he stood on that mountain and he opened his mouth to curse God's people. And when he opened his mouth, he began to say, blessed be the people of God. You're blessed in the city and and blessed are your children. And Balak says, stop. He says, I asked you to curse them, not bless them. It's very interesting that in this story, God's people never moved out of position. Israel never moved. So Balaam had to move. 
And he thought, if I get in a different place, in a different geographical place, then I can curse him from there. But can I tell you, it does not matter where the enemy goes right now in the earth. What God has already put his blessing on, you can't curse it. Nobody that's in the will of God can ever be cursed by the devil. You don't have to worry about the enemy today. If God's blessed you, you are blessed. And there is no sorcerer, there's no politician, there's no demon that can stand up on you and say you're cursed. No, we're not. We are the blessed seed of the Lord. There is a blood of Jesus Christ on us to protect Protect us by the Spirit of God. If you are blessed, how many times, if you're honest, think, boy, I hope this doesn't happen? The enemy will get you to begin to think on things that have never happened. Because he can't create. When you are blessed, you do not have to worry and be fearful of being cursed. This is one of the things that I've learned after having the Holy Ghost for 59 years. Even when you're going through tough things, you are all right if you are in the will of God. You cannot interpret difficult moments as the devil has gotten access to you. Because the enemy will trespass into your life illegally to intimidate you. But you have the authority to look at that spirit and tell him, you're not going to intimidate me. I am blessed. And what God has blessed, you can't curse. So I'm telling you, take your two horns and your little backside and walk back out the same way you walked in because you are in the wrong house messing with the wrong people. Why? Because there is a bloodline of protection around you and you are safe in the hands of God. Ask the man that's cancer free. It may look like he was cursed, but he doesn't have cancer today. There is no curse on him. Why? Because what God has blessed, the enemy cannot curse. Being blessed is it's not the car you drive. It's not the house that you live in. It's not the money that you have in the bank. That's not being blessed. Those are the symptoms of being blessed. But it's not the root of being blessed. In fact, the Bible talks about being blessed and... um, when there's a, there's a lot of different meanings for the word blessed. One of them is happy. But really happy is a weak kind of definition of being blessed. It, it comes from an old English word, hap. We get, the word, we get the word happen from that. So it almost sounds like the only way that we are blessed is something has to happen and then we're blessed. But being blessed, hallelujah, doesn't have to have something to happen. When you get saved, you are blessed. God takes a stamp and he goes, boom, 
blessed. Hallelujah. And on your life, there is written across you, blessed, blessed, blessed. Hallelujah. When they came out of the baptismal tank and got the Holy Ghost, honey, God stamped you with a stamp that said blessed in the Spirit of the Lord. In fact, you can be going through really difficult times and still be blessed. All of us have gone through lean times. When I had one old car, just as a young preacher, I remember going to, back then they called it um, a, uh, co- a kind of a general conference thing, and you know, everybody came, and, and uh, I had on a, a black suit and an overcoat. It was worn out. And I had an old 67 red Mustang that really needed to be junked, but it was all I could afford. And I remember pulling up after the service to a 7-Eleven to get something, and when I came out, uh, the linkage on my transmission, I knew it was bad, and I couldn't get it in the gear. And with other church people around, I had to get out and take off my overcoat and crawl under my old Mustang and manually use that coat hanger I had wired in there to shift it. (laughs) But you know what? I was blessed. Hallelujah. I was blessed because it's not a man's life does not consist in the things that he possesses. It consists in the position that he occupies in the spirits. And you're going to go through seasons where you may not have a whole lot, but you are still blessed in the kingdom of God. And though it may look like you don't have anything, when your father has you in his house, you still have access to what God owned because what is his is yours. And there are always going to be those seasons where the Balaam's in your life will try from different geographical places to curse you. Really, I think the great definition of being blessed is this. It is the ability to overcome any adversity in your life. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because when I step into the valley, I had blessed stamped on my soul. And when I'm walking through it, I got blessed stamped on me. And I will come out of it, hallelujah, untouched by the power of the enemy. It does not matter. Yes, we may do some weeping in the night. But can I tell you, the night just declares that there is a sun getting ready to rise in your life. There may be an Ishmael, but it's declaring that Isaac is on the way. I see a John the Baptist, but he's declaring there's one coming after me who is preferred before me, and he's greater than me. It doesn't matter what's happening today in America. I can tell you it's going to change by the power of God because our nation is blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There is a blessing of God on us. Doesn't matter. Listen, you cannot look at the moment. I remember when our church went through a difficult time. 
and we went down to less than 80 people. And I had somebody tell me the glory of God has left this place. Look. Hallelujah. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. Hallelujah. And this is just the beginning of what God is doing by the Spirit of the Lord. You and I are on the ground floor in this nation on what the Lord is beginning to do by the Spirit of God. We've had a Balaam stand up in our courts and in our nation and try to curse the United States of America, try to curse Canada. But can I tell you, by the power of the Lord, you cannot curse. Curse what God has called blessed. And we got too many Holy Ghost, tongue-talking, apostolic men and women in the United States of America that love God, that God is not going to give us up, but there is favor, favor, favor of God upon you and me. Hallelujah. Just because you have adversity doesn't mean you're not blessed. You have adversity because you are blessed. And the devil is after you. Hallelujah. He doesn't mess with people that don't worry him. He messes with people that worry him. He doesn't worry about cursing people that don't have a glory understanding of who God is. But when you get a group of people together like this in worship that can move like this. Incidentally, you remember when Timothy Dixon prophesied or he was telling some dream and, and I was in a sweat because the time he got done because he was talking about Big Kent, Little Kent. <laughs> Today, uh, Big Kent was sitting right there and Little Kent was prophesying. Right. Jasmine. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I was watching her. I thought, well, that's me. And I thought, I'm blessed because I got one of my children prophesying under the Holy Ghost by the power of the Lord. Can I tell you, I see your children coming in by the power of God. In the last days, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. God has set your house blessed by the power of the Lord. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. They belong in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Adversity just declares that you're blessed. But being blessed, listen, the reason that we are blessed is because we are in the house. What the enemy is trying to do is get you to leave your place. Fear will make you change the way you do things. You know, I've been, I've been fighting high blood pressure. Never had it in my life. Uh, went to a, 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 an individual who's really good at dealing with this kind of stuff and uh, has some has medical understanding, and they drew my blood and stuff, and they said, for the, we never saw, she said, there is an epidemic of high blood pressure in America, and began to pull my blood, and you could see chunks of calcium in there, and, <clears throat> uh, you know, for me, it's a little, it's a little more hitting home, because that's what my son died from, Joshua die from high blood pressure and <clears throat> uh, the other day uh, I, I, I'd gotten a, uh, a blood pressure cuff and uh, I had put it on and I mean it was really high it was 
170 over 110. And, uh, I, you know, I've been taking things, and I told the Lord, I said, if I consent to take high blood pressure medicine, then how do I stand on the platform and pray for people and believe that God's going to heal them if I can't get victory over this? And I took it yesterday, and my loan number was all the way down to 82, which is just a couple above. But I made a decision that I would resist this demon spirit and that God was my medicine. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not indicting anyone for doing it, but I just felt like I needed to conquer this thing. I refuse... Because I told the, the Bible says this, it says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and him who defiles that temple, him God shall destroy. I told the Holy Ghost, I said, it's your house, and you got a demon of high blood pressure and they're messing it up. You need to get him out. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got to talk to God like that. You got to have that kind of understanding that you can have a conversation with the Lord. It doesn't have to be these and thous and all of that. You can just have an old fashioned southern conversation with God because He understands through the knees. That's a word I made up. <laughs> a couple of days ago, I felt, I was laying down, I felt something just leave me. And I declare by faith that I'm not dying of high blood pressure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And today I loose the healing power of the Lord over everybody in this building, everybody that's listening to me that's fighting this disease. I curse high blood pressure in the name of Jesus. And I speak over your body. I speak over your life in the name of Jesus that you are normal by the power of the Lord. <clears throat> In this story, the devil wanted this son because this son had access to his father's inheritance. And the father's inheritance allowed him to control...